All right, well, thank you very much for the invitation to speak, Jerry. I got to know Jerry through talking about systems, uh, philosophy of science, and so I might go a bit off to his reservation here and, and, uh, and look at some of the systemic issues and how we can get to predictive and preventative medicine uh, and, and really incorporate data, genomic data into that. So, so the challenge really is how do we make a systemic shift to genomic-enabled predictive and preventative medicine? I'd like to talk about three facets of, of, of this. Well, genetic research, which is where, where we deal with all the time, clinical decisions, and societal adoption. I spent, I spent about a month consulting for a consulting company that was looking at the systemic causes of the failure strategy execution. So this was you know, looking at or large organizations. Why do we fail to get the outcomes that we desire? And if you essentially do the five whys across many different dimensions and really drill down, you find that we have deficits in how we manage complexity, uncertainty, and frankly, the people side of change and conflict. And so with that sort of template, I'm going to look at, at those three aspects of genetic research, clinical decisions, and societal adoption, and, and, and thinking about if we can't even use the preventative techniques that we have today, uh, like getting regular scheduled checkups and so forth, how are we going to go to the place where, where predictive and preventative medicine is going to use all these wonderful new technologies, including electronic health records, and including going to a future where we're going to have longitudinal uh, gene expression data and so forth measured regularly and, and give us true indications and early warnings of disease. In looking at complexity and, and genetic research, 20 years ago, you could look at gels and the, com the complexity of data analytics was probably a spreadsheet was as, as complex as most of it got. And so we generally had to have good knowledge of biology and genome sciences to do research. Today, we need that, but then we need all of these IT uh, techno geek skills, uh, including programming, database administration, uh, this paper uh, lists about nine different things that, that is very rare to find in one individual. We've also seen data collection changing rapidly. Uh, earlier, we discussed how, how cost of sequencing is going down and we're getting big and big data. I'm really glad we covered that. A good analogy is as we looked at the evolution of the PC from a mainframe to mini computer to personal computer. Uh, you know, it started with big rooms full of lots of people and equipment, and then it moves to just one person, one computer, uh, and, and the era of personal sequencing is, is closing upon us where we may be able to plug a USB enabled device in our computer and drop blood on it and get measurements and be generating uh, uh, gigabytes of data. So this idea that, that computational uh, power and cost have actually dropped faster, uh, not as fast as, as, as DNA sequencing, has led to a crossing of the cost curves where it's now becoming more expensive to actually analyze and store the data than it is to generate it. And um, however, you know, with all the mantras, you know, big data is so hard and so forth, it's not like the world hasn't dealt with big data in the past. Look at astrophysics, look at geophysics, there's much bigger data. So infrastructure problems of, of you know, storage and, and compute power, uh, uh, that's been done before, but, but really it's the, the synthetic and analytic aspects that there's a new, new uh, phrase being used or a new, a new title being created called a data scientist. It's pretty much a statistician or an applied mathematician or a computer scientist all blended into one who also has managerial and higher level abstract thinking to look at complex problems. But there's a real shortage in that synthetic high level um, analytic capability also uh, pa uh, paired together with all of those technical skills that were listed earlier. And here's a McKinsey report talking about the shortage that we're facing. As you look at, you know, we talked to a lot of uh, professors and it's kind of an emerging phenomenon where that lack of skills in senior researchers in all this data science uh, uh, stuff, especially with regard to analytics on big data, leads to, to real challenges in, in, in the research productivity loop. As you know, academia exists to con convert dollars into, into reputation. Well, no, not quite, but, but that is the prime metric of academia. And, and as, you, as you have that 
in all of science being driven by big data, not having sufficient analytic competency and capacity leads to less results, fewer publications, lower tier journals, less impact, less reputation, harder to get funding, harder to, you know, to have the research capacity to do your research. And you can get into a vicious feedback loop where there's a lot of professors who want to contribute who, 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 who don't have any grants anymore and, and don't have the analytic skills to, to do the research. And, um, and then those the haves, the best the have-nots, can create a virtuous loop of, of you know, productivity and impact and, and more funding and more research. <clears throat> so I looked at NIH funding data for the last 25 years. It's very interesting. This data is all public. I looked at the number of authors per publication in 1985 versus 2011, where I closed the, the data. And it's gone up from a little, a little over three to, to a little over six authors per publication. I say, well, our, you know, our academic just a bunch of <clears throat> credit hounds and everyone's wanting their name on it. Well, that might be a factor. But I think what's really going on is we're dealing with this complexity. It's taking larger teams to get the research done. <clears throat> and so, you know, um, but then the question is, what is our productivity looking like as we're supposedly collaborating? And I think there's some, it's useful to define a difference between uh, teamwork and collaboration. Whereas I think a lot of teamwork actually goes on, where we, we're, we're dividing up the work, you do this, I do this based on my expertise, but the synthesis and the higher order, um, um, well, synthesis of knowledge that goes on, um, which I call true collaboration, which is you know that division of labor plus that sum that's greater than the parts is probably what's missing as we actually see that the publication output per scientist, if you credit a scientist uh, like a seventh of a publication, if there's seven names on the publication, it's actually been dropping from a little over half a publication per author per year down to about a third. And, and this is just counting authors actually publish something. So this is not averaging in authors who publish nothing. At the same time, we're facing uh, that the cost per publication has been rising to about $350,000 a paper. And uh, uh, if you followed sort of the reproducible research phenomena where they're estimating something like 10 to 30% of papers actually reproduce at all, it's getting upwards of one to three million dollars per piece of reproducible research that's actually published. Right, so you, you should say though that that's for clinical research studies. I mean, that is the yeah. So of the That doesn't necessarily report. refer to all research, but... Right, but it's an important method. Yeah. How then can we, you know, if this is an important leverage point of dealing with complexity, uh, our, our, our capability of collaboration, how can we do better? Well, why do we do division of labor? Um, the, 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 the real pro is we can consider subsystems independently, and then assuming the subsystem is less complex, we can deal with the degrees of freedom there. But the con is, once you've got all these subsystems, your, your interface is increased. I mean, we see this in large hierarchical organizations. We break down the work, but then how do we do all the cross-functional coordination? So uh, many times, though, the interface management is what gets left out when we just do straight division of labor. And we miss those emergent properties that are, that are seen as a function of, of, of the many systems combined. So there's a lot of stuff I could say about improving uh, uh, collaboration. Um, I think one of the ones I'd like to focus on <clears throat> is the concept of, of, of boundary objects and parity of relative expertise. Picture an uh, uh, architect working with a homeowner, and the architect shows the home, potential homeowner a blueprint say, this is the house we're going to build. And the, and the homeowner looks at that and has no way of, in their head, visualizing the three dimensions what that house is going to look like. And we wonder why there's so much change requests as the house gets built. So it turns out that artifact, that shared understanding, that boundary object where we, where we come together and have our understanding of what we're doing, you need to have both sides have equal skill with that boundary object. And, um, and it needs to be a good one. And so as they moved to three-dimensional modeling in architecture, then you had a, 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 you know, a regular person can understand a 3D walk through of a building, and collaboration gets a lot better. <clears throat> and so kind of sum up the, the challenge, these, one of the, one of the conflicts these challenge, that researchers are facing in dealing with complexity is 
this is called an evaporating cloud diagram or a conflict resolution diagram, you have a common goal, which is, uh, you know, I want to be a prominent, secure scientist. And we're hearing from so many of them, I want control over the analysis of my own data. I don't want to worship at the high priest with a high priest of bioinformatics to hope that they will deign to give me some of their time to analyze my data. I want to do it myself. Um, and so, uh, and plus, you know, I prefer to actually keep some of that, more of that credit for myself. Um, but really, a scientist needs to analyze their own data. That's, that's really what the work of scientists is. And so there's pressure to sort of collaborate less and specialize on just, just what you can do. But then if you want to work on complex problems and make important breakthroughs, there's pressure to collaborate more and, and do that syn synthesis. So uncertainty. I'd like to go to the clinical realm. And we've done actually some, some, some work with a, with a company uh, to build the analytics to do cytogenetic data processing. So we've, we've actually worked with the whole tuning of cytogenetic parameters for how you can um, assess whether a, uh, a genetic microarray uh, signals contain uh, copy number variants. And so for 20, 30, probably 40 years now, the standard has been karyotyping in fish. If you've ever seen those stained uh, uh, chromosomes, they would look at them through a microscope, and if the stains were bigger, or longer, or shorter than expected, you could say that there was a, 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 a gain or a loss in a large sector of a chromosome. And so you'd look at stuff like Down syndrome as an extra copy of 21, uh, uh, chromosome 21. And, and the surprising statistic is only about 3 to 5% of the kid, you know, a kid comes with developmental delay, birth defects, etc. There's something genetically wrong. And only three to five percent of the time do they actually see something uh, wrong in the karyogram. They moved to higher resolution uh, microarrays and got the clinical yields up to 20 percent. But what happened was the certainty that they had when you had a massive deletion or gain has, has gone to a whole place of uncertainty where there's lots and lots of copy number variants all over the genome, many benign, many of unknown significance. And, um, and so we kind of give up that almost binary certainty for this distribution of well, we're not sure with a lot of these, a lot of these findings. And so, as we move from from microarrays to now sequencing, which is even higher density, the management of, of uncertainty in that clinical setting is 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 just compounded dramatically. Um, and you know, the promise might be 30 to 50 percent clinical yields with sequencing. But how do you deal with the uncertainty? And, and really what the essence of the, the, the dilemma is, is there's pressure on one hand to kind of not know too much, just the stuff we're really sure about, so we don't make errors of commission. And as you know, we're, we tend to be punished for stuff that the errors of commission, and, and often the errors of omission because they aren't done, uh, we sort of get a hall pass on that. But if we want to really learn the most we can about a patient and help the, you know, 95% in the case that was not addressed with karyotyping or, or, the, or the large numbers that are still go undiagnosed, there's pressure to use a higher resolution genetic assay. But we move to this place of greater uncertainty and we just can't give these light and dark uh, answers anymore. And so, I've got an interesting list you could scan through of, of, you know, if you go to a cytogenetics conference and you hear them talking about the challenges they have with these higher density arrays and their fear and trepidation about sequencing, it's all about, um, you know, uh, what thresholds do I pick to be sure I'm, I'm not screwing up here? And there's all sorts of thresholds. Each, each, each company sort of has its own, its own definitions of it. And, and sort of masked out is, is actual an understanding of the underlying uncertainty. And I think it's, 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 it's something that, that, that uh, um, we're, we're trying to essentially impose a certainty that's not there. Um, and we just, we just don't know enough in many cases to make definitive judgments and probably never will. So finally, the hardest one is, is looking at um, change in conflict. And, uh, Metaphors and stories are actually one of the technologies for change, and so I'll use a little one. So here's, does this guy look a bit like Jerry down here in this, in this picture? And, and so here he is at the bottom of the hill, and he's looking at this promise, you know, uh, golden uh, casket full of, full of wealth and wonder, which is, you know, predictive and preventative medicine. 
and, and it looks really good, why don't you just going up and get it? Well, when, when we're considering a change of going for something that seems good for us, there's always the risks that we might, you know, on that treacherous path to getting there, we'll break our legs. On the other side, um, there's some things about the current situation that might be pretty nice for us. In fact, he's got this mermaid in a pond down here that uh, keeps him company, and uh, she, she can't go up the, the mountain with him. And, and generally, we need some sort of crisis, some sort of serious pain, for big changes at least, of an alligator that's going to bite our heels to sort of chase us up the hill. So these four aspects of change um, really have to be addressed as we're thinking about, about transformation. And so, let's just look at the patient, uh, the patient story. How do we do that? So, predictive and preventative medicine. You know, why do we wait for uh, for that first heart attack to start doing something? And many times we don't with our health. Well, it seems like there's plenty of plenty of, of negative things about suffering and design and dying, where um, 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 this, this really challenging us as patients. That that you'd think, hey, prevention would be a good thing. Um, we, we have a lot to gain in terms of a longer and healthier, more secure life. Um, but it kind of requires us to be a patient when we're not sick. You know, it seems like we have to do invasive testing, we're going to have to pay expenses when we're young and healthy. You know, what's, 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 uh, that doesn't seem too pleasant. Maybe it's surmountable. But the real challenge is, is, is in the mermaid quadrant, and a friend of mine calls it the slutty mermaid because it's that stuff we we're often not too honest about ourselves about, or certainly don't want others to know about, which is, you know, we want to live life in the moment, not worry about the future, spend little time on resources, uh, on healthcare when we're healthy, and basically live short term and avoid anxiety about death. Now, you just look at one person, and you're trying to make this change for yourself, look at it systemically, Patients, medical professionals, hospitals and clinics, insurance providers and government officials, and I won't have time to delve into all of this, but we have preventable individual and institutional disease, stand to gain individual and institutional health and prosperity of going to predictive and preventative medicine, but we risk a lot of individual and institutional identity and security challenges. Think of government, you've got to supervise huge, expensive, risky, thankless change efforts. Uh, that, sounds, that sounds pretty risky. And finally, uh, uh, we want to enjoy, you know, what's good about now. Well, things aren't too bad yet. So, to, uh, if you look at almost all conflicts fall into these two generic categories of the security growth conflict of changing and not changing, and sort of I, me versus us, we, the individual versus the collective. And I can't expand on it with the limited time, but in conclusion, as we're looking at dealing with complexity, beware imposing a false simplicity. In uncertainty, beware imposing a false certainty. And in change and conflict, let's beware uh, imposing on each other. And recognize that paradigm shifts do take time. Thank you.